welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the first chapter in a brand new DMT story written by myself, edited and produced, of course. <laughs> um, as ever, please do let me know down below, guys, in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share, and don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. If you haven't subscribed to DMT, please do smash that subscribe button and throat punch the notification bell to stay up to date with all DMT content. And without further ado, let's get into tonight's first chapter of the story I'd like to entitle The Return to Taylor, Mississippi. Chapter 1. Let's get straight into that. My name here is not important, but I guess John will suffice. What is important is I get this out to as many people as possible. They're here, and always have been. Hell, they're even in the movies or TV, right in plain sight. But the time everyone realises, I fear it will be too late, or it may already be so. The call came in just as I entered the office. I barely had a sip of my crappy coffee from the overpriced coffee joint back in town. A runner had escaped whilst in transportation to San Quentin State Penitentiary. Suspect was described as a monster of a man at six foot nine, heavy build, Caucasian with long dark to black coloured hair, striking green eyes and a notable facial scar across his right cheek, with several others on different parts of his torso. Suspect was also described as suffering with paranoid schizophrenia, bipolar and other mental ailments or difficulties. Just great. I said aloud to myself as I sipped my already cold cup of coffee and poked around my packet for another cigarette. Another loony tuned psycho built like Arnold Schwarzenegger for me to track down. Just what I need. If I could back this guy though, it would mean one sweet ass paycheck. I enjoyed working solo as a bounty hunter, but as I viewed his records it soon was obvious this wasn't going to be routine. <laughs> Far from it in fact, but I guess we'll start at the beginning. So it turned out this guy, a Mr. Bill Chambers, was a real piece of shit. He had an arrest and convictions record as long as he was tall. All pretty hardcore too, from battery with deadly weapons, abduction and torture to multiple people, rape and murder on six counts. Once he was put into penitentiary with the lifers, well, he kind of handed out his own judgments and sentences. This is where it gets interesting. And because of all of the trouble he was causing at San Quentin State Prison, a place with its very own nightmare stories where death of inmates is an almost a daily occurrence. The system decided it was time to transfer Bill to ADX, Maximum Security Facility, in Colorado. Unfortunately for the three guards in transport with Bill, it would be their last shift. At some point between Utah or Colorado, the vehicle crashed, killing, or at least it appeared to have killed the guards and died from their trauma in the accident. But a suspect, a psycho suspect, completely gone, shackles broken clean from their chains. Feds were at a loss and the bounty was doubled in 48 hours of him being loose as reports started flying in about hikers being mauled and attacked. Most were killed but one or two were lucky and survived, although it depends if you count missing your lips and nose and fingers lucky. Yeah, anyway, that's when it caught my attention. Eventually days turned into weeks and now months have passed. Everyone else has come to the conclusion that Bill simply died from the elements and starvation, but I knew something wasn't right. I mean, call me suspicious, but he gets loose and within 48 hour period, innocent people at nearby forested locations were attacked by a madman, quote and unquote, bloodthirsty animal. I started to chase up a few contacts I have and managed to get some copies of the survivor's statement. It was clear that whatever had attacked this lady's old man, it scared her to her bones. She was referred to a psych clinic and the feds noted that she was mumbling strange words like, it's eyes, red, Claus Wolf! It seemed the events had tilted her over the edge, and now her mind was no longer sound. She had only escaped with her life as she played dead. I was now beginning to think that this was indeed an animal attack, and as I received the post-mortem images, I was certain. No man could inflict the damage caused to the husband, with his limbs ripped from their sockets. A stranger still, it appears the meat and bloodied ends were sucked clear of bone marrow, almost like an armed popsicle. The remaining meat in shreds loose hanging void of colour as the blood had been sucked clean. His lower jaws 
completely and utterly crushed from each side. Bear? I thought. No, it couldn't be. Bear would have mauled his back and buttocks. Plus, the back of the neck is usually a prime target for a bear attack. I perused the other case file from a camp location, three miles away. A small family had been camping for the week and unfortunately found that by midweek, they were the only family left on site. Now I'm sure at first, this would have seemed ideal. But however, I feel it was key to their demise. They were slaughtered whilst it appears they were sleeping. The mother and father both never even made it out of their bunk, and the children scattered into the darkness of the forest. One by one they were eventually picked off. Three of the five children's remains were retrieved from elevated points. The first two were in a tree together. Perhaps they fled the campsite together, we'll never know. The third was found 90 plus metres up a sheer rock face. It took specialist climbers to retrieve the remains, and as far as I heard, they both discontinued working in a field due to how shocking the site was. I'll save you the gruesome details, but post-mortem reports suggested an extremely large canine or bear attack. Of course, the latter was used as a public cover-up, equally as severe as the parents' injuries, and no mercy was ever shown. A truly horrible case, and one that I shall not forget. After that case, things went cold for a while, possibly a month plus, and absolutely nothing. Not a gnat's ass of a hint to where he was holding up. Search teams with dogs had exhausted all efforts, and once again, they assumed he had succumbed to the elements. I had all but given up when I visited my old friend Beanhead. He was a weird guy, but his heart was in the right place. The thing with Bean is he never left his trailer. I mean, never. But he continuously researched alien conspiracies and all types of crazy crap. He knew how to hack and find people really good too. So it kind of made my job, well, easier. It, it worked both ways, you know. Anyway, everyone called him Bean as his head was well. Shaped like a baked bean, and he was ginger. Anyway, as I was saying... I visited Bean and we hung out and cracked a few beers. Well, Bean had started ranting on and on like he always did. I kind of zoned in and out, but then he caught my attention. Someone literally ripped their arms off and legs off the bodies. The whole family, man. God, it's sick, you know? I cut him short. Yeah, yeah wait, what? Repeat what you just said. So, sure, uh, so the Clintons, the, the reptilians and... No, not that dumbass, I screamed. The bodies, the limbs ripped off. I said, shaking my head. Oh shit, okay, sure. Well, two nights ago, way back up in the Wichita Mountains in Oki, two more separate groups of people have gone missing. Now, they found where one party were camping. But the equipment and the clothing was completely torn, destroyed. Also reports of multiple blood pools in locations in and around the camp area, leading into the deeper forest. And one deceased, one deceased is staked to the earth. I, I, I mean... What could do such? Can you get me everything you can get on this ASAP? Everything, Bean. This is it. Is what? Bean asked, confused and a little worried. It's got to be that crazy suspect I was tracking, but lost before he realised I was onto him. I responded, with dollar signs in my eyes like Scrooge McDuck. John, you can't be seriously thinking to do this, man. I mean, how could anyone rip limbs from a body of their victim? It's just not possible, John. He declared, spilling his microwave noodles down his already stained brown top. I know it's him because he's already did exactly that to a family with five kids. All of them hunted down in the middle of the night through cold, wet, dark forest. Picked off like rabbits, I volleyed back. His eyes widened, then slowly narrowed, as if he expected me to finally admit I was joking. When I didn't change my expression, his eyes widened once more. But, but how? Why? I mean, not why per se, but... How? He was completely white and perplexed at how a man could physically manage such a task. I don't know, Bing, but he did it for sure. I'll spare you the rest of the victims. I added. Rest? He said, shocked. Ugh, yeah, man. There were multiple groups of hikers and campers going missing, and then found like that. Some in the damn bunk still, and others fled deeper into the forest. Authorities believe that he had died from the cold and lack of food. I wasn't sure. It's been almost two months since I had anything remotely suggestive of him being alive, let alone still slaughtering people. Bean's horrified face remained shocked, and then he immediately jumped over to his work area. It was a mess, but it worked for him, I guess. Anyway, he managed to pull up more reports from three different states, such as Kansas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Twelve separate cases totaled his trial of carnage and senseless killing, all with the same grotesque technique of killing. However, two of the other cases caught my attention, they were very similar to the Chambers case in the level of violence, but not entirely. 
but I'll get back to that later. I remained with Beanhead until 4.30am, gathering as much information on the murders and information on the locations. You can't do this solo, John, he said as I popped my truck door. Are you going to come with me, Bean? I said mockingly, but with a smile. Nope, I ain't that stupid. Besides, I've got to look after my plants. They need me. He responded, smiling back. Yeah, they do, you crazy old bastard. Don't be smoking yourself dumb now. I cracked back and climbed into my truck. Waving me off in the headlight beams and early morning fog was Beanhead still casually in his dirty-ass white underwear, with one sock hanging loose and long off one foot. Damn, you are one crazy old boy, but you've got eyes and ears like an eagle. I said aloud as I pulled out onto the long dirt road and away from Beanhead's property. I needed a drink and so I reached for my scotch flask in a dashboard drawer and took three heavy swigs, hitting my belly and gut with a warm and fiery feeling. My nerves and excitement calmed and the job was now back on. I was heading to Arkansas and the Ozark Mountains. He had no doubt covered more ground in the last two days, but I was back on his trail. I settled in for the night at a seedy motel and went over everything that had taken place, trying to find a common denominator, a reason for the violence, and more importantly, where the hell was he heading? Or more to the point, how was he still alive and able to cover so much ground? He had to have either had help or hijacked a car or a form of transport. But, but all the recent murders... They've been deep in the back country, I mean way back. No road access, not really. Not unless you were half crazy and had a truck to match. It's desolate. Nothing but the wind and the endless miles and miles of trees. Did you know that over half of Arkansas is completely forested? That's more than two and a half million acres within the three main state parks. So yeah, it wasn't going to be an easy task by no means. But I was good at this and I always got my man. If I couldn't find him within a month out there, then I'd make him come to me. I awoke the next afternoon, my head cloudy from polishing off the rest of the scotch. A voicemail from Bean telling me to call him ASAP. I got washed up and dressed before calling him and heading back onto the road. I was around two, maybe three hours away from the first trailhead location in the Ozark National Forest. It would be a long and dangerous hike on foot further and deeper into the backcountry forest areas that a missing party was believed to have been in. The weather was cold, but the chances of rain were minimal, although the sky suggested totally different. Again, my head throbbed and my stomach moaned and sloshed around the last night's scotch, marinated, empty stomach. All of a sudden my phone went. Bean, it's me, what's up? I asked. John, you, you've got to leave this one for the army man. What? No, Bean, I'm cool, man. I've faced far worse groups of runners before. It'll be over and done in no time and we can go about spending all that bank. I declared, hoping that he would shut up, as he was making me nervous, and I'd heard it all before. However... He persisted and then gave me an update, an update that sent tiny needles of fright up my spine like sharp spider legs creeping their way up and then down. John, he's... he's not he... well, he is, but rather more of a it. He continued, sounding more and more delusional by the minute, talking about secret cult groups, online and within the government, even the CIA, DEA and FBI, hurtling along at 500 miles an hour. Animal testing, super soldier, ancient bloodlust, secret underground facilities, even DNA splicing and reformation. I lost track of my patience, and I eventually screamed at Beanhead to shut up and just laid out plain and simple what the hell he was trying to say. As I did so, he calmly stopped, bleating and ranting. He took a deep breath, and in the most composed voice I'd ever heard, leave his toothy mouth, he said, John, he's... he's not normal. He's, he's got a condition or a disease I don't know. Nobody does. There are a couple of the deep web sites and chats that I go on and... And... And what, Bean? I beckoned angrily at him. Well, a couple of the chatroom people were talking about secret cult or government super soldier projects or ancient bloodlines between man and beast or something I don't fully understand yet myself, but... John, they mentioned channeling dark magic or spirits, that sort of thing. I don't get it, but, well, one of the rituals they were discussing was a ritual that would grant people the power, strength... An agility of ten wolf-like beasts, something along the lines of dogman, but not natural. More like a position or arrangement between human and demon, he said, with a tone so sobering that for a minute he had me. That it? I asked hurriedly. No, not entirely, he responded. You see, one of the symptoms of such ritual is bloodlust, insatiable hunger and anger, increased awareness of the senses, possibly even new ones. Do you get what I'm saying to you, John? This is not something you want to get involved in. It's been going on like this for hundreds, 
if not thousands of years. He's a real-life werewolf, damn it, John. Could you not see? He screamed at me, losing all calm and composure he'd previously kept. Werewolves, Ben, I responded mockingly at his suggestion. Well, you believe in the vampire cases of New Orleans, didn't you? He added. He was right, I did believe those attacks to be at the hands of real-life blood-sucking vampires. But I had fought them in my work, seen them up close. I barely escaped with my life on more than one occasion. But yeah, man, I knew they were real. So why not werewolves? There's more, Bean added. More? For God's sake, Bean, what else? I replied. Yes, more. Way more, John. Listen, from the pattern of the attacks in general direction, I believe he may be headed to a particular town in Mississippi. Where, Bean? There's a little country town way out in the middle of nowhere. The town has a very long and persistent history of dogman encounters and sightings. Some even believe the town's folk are in on it, and even real-life werewolves. Well, if I had to put my money on a destination, I'd say it's the town of Taylor, Mississippi. As he said the last sentence, a knot had begun to twist in my chest, and my heart slipped a few beats. Taylor, eh? You're pretty confident on this, Bean? I asked. Pretty much, John. But listen, you can't seriously expect to take this guy on, especially if he makes it to Taylor. What if the rumours are indeed true? What if you truck his hairy ass deep into the back country, and the town turn and hunt you down with him? He shouted. They won't, I said. How do you know that, John? He's a damn werewolf. We don't know anything from this point out. He added upset and genuinely concerned about my safety. Look, Bean, I'll be fine. I'm armed with full metal jacket ammo and my MP5. Plus, I've got the 50 cal judge, just in case. Please, see what you can find out from your weirdo group chat room. And they'll have a look into some more info into the history of Taylor. I've already heard of the Dogman sightings in recent years. Could this really be Bill Chambers' plan all along? How would a Dogman react to the abomination that was a werewolf? Did they kick it together? I goddamn hope not, as I continued on the interstate with the sunset just starting to wash in the horizon into an incredible deep blend of oranges and purples. The moon just started to shine brightly in the oncoming nighttime sky. Hundreds of miles later, and what felt like hundreds of hours, I finally made my way down old Taylor Road. This road was nothing more than a thin strip of tarmac between miles and miles of woods and fields eventually leading to the quiet town of Taylor, Mississippi. I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous in such a location, with the amount of paranormal activity and dogman sightings as Taylor. My fear was confirmed on my first night in town. After arriving around early evening at maybe 6 or 7pm, I checked myself into a shitty old B&B run by a really old and obnoxious man in his late 70s, if I had to guess. Anyway, he was very particular about my smoking and said that the front door would be locked from 10pm to 6am every night in the summer and 7 to 8pm in the winter. My guess was the dogman problem, or it really was just a pain in the ass control freak. I dumped my bags upstairs in my room and decided to hit the local bar and see what info I could gather on these local dogs. I holstered my judge and set out around 6.30pm into the waning evening light. The town seemed unusually busy as people rushed around, getting whatever it was that they needed. I noticed a huge amount of Bibles and crucifixes for sale, pretty much in every store. Hell, even the bar had a big dusty old Bible. It looked like it was a hundred years old. I made my way into the local bar and sat at the bar counter. All eyes were on me, but Tupac was spinning its rounds in my head, as not a strange glance or straight up stare was wasted. <clears throat> I cleared my throat, trying to gain the barkeep's attention, as he leaned on the counter on the opposite end of the bar speaking with the five local guys. They looked like truckers, but I never did find out. Anyway, my attempt to gain some service was as successful as the maiden voyage of the Titanic. All I received was a blank four-second stare from all six men before they shook their heads and carried on their conversation. Okay, if that's how we're doing things, I said aloud. I tried the nice guy way in close-knit towns like this before. I wasn't about to be ignored, especially when it came to getting my nightly scotch fix. With an utter lack of any response, I shrugged my shoulders and got off my stool. I then walked round to the end of the bar and behind it and grabbed a bottle of 60-year single malt off the shelf and calmly made my way back to my stool. I could see them in my peripheral gearing up and heading my way. Hey! One of the men shouted, and the barman had retreated to his side of the counter. Hey! You can't just walk up in here and grab my favourite bottle off the bar. I glanced up to see the largest of the five men grabbing a pool cue and storming his way over to me, his buddy in tow also. Just who the hell do you think you are? I heard one of them say before finally I was face to face with this would-be posse. What's the problem, gents? 
I barked, looking at each one in his eyes. You can't... You can't just come in here and take that there bottle. It's mine, and I want it now. Said this six foot five, three hundred pound sack of shit, smelling of chewing tobacco and cheap whiskey. Is that right, huh? I added. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my badge and showed them my judge on my side. I guess it would be a real pain in the ass to run new boys through the system, check out any outstanding warrants. But then, that would be the boring thing to do. No, I'd much prefer finishing this bottle with you boys like gentlemen. And in return, you can all tell me about your late night visitors. I said with a cold hard stare at the wannabe Hulk who up until the last sentence looked smoother than a Garth Brooks album. W what? They squeaked, clearly unprepared for me being aware of such things. You need to leave, son. Leave right now before it's too late, he responded angrily. No, sir. I can't do that just yet. If you boys consider yourselves clever, you'll sit and drink with me because if you don't, I can't help warning you of the abomination of a creature that is headed this way. Hell, possibly already here. The men's faces remained shocked, even pale in colour, at just the mention of a dogman. Whatever was going on in this town, it looked like they weren't part of it. Just then a tall and stocky guy came fumbling in through the bar doors, half tripping and then falling to the tiled floor in front of the shocked onlookers. What the? I managed to say aloud before a couple of men ran over to help the guy up of the hard floor. As soon as they lifted him up, a large crimson puddle pulled on the floor below him. It became apparent he had been attacked outside and was now very much bleeding out right in front of our eyes. His abdomen was slashed and clawed immensely from chest to groin. He was opened up, a loud <gasps> pitched throughout the establishment. Let's get him over to the table over here, said one of the men, help him. A few of the remaining would-be local bullies glanced over at me with a look of, well, I guess we do know what you're talking about. I nodded and said, you see, I'm here to warn you all, and maybe I can help also. I don't quite know how, but I'm working on it, goddammit. I was met with murmurs from around the bar and remaining men next to me. You're crazy. There's nothing you can do. It's too late now. There's too many of them, said one of the men, who then tipped his hat at me and then the other men before swiftly leaving out the door, sidestepping around and through the crowd of the people gathered around the now ghostly white man on the table, blood beginning to run off the table side and puddle below. Seconds later, there was a roar of a truck engine firing up and soon followed with a screech of tyres as he peeled out of the parking lot. The other guys in front turned to each other, and then decided they too were calling it a night. They downed their drinks and hurriedly moved to the doors before stepping out of the bar. The men popped their heads out of the doors and looked left, and then right. Before darting out of the doors, panic audible as they did so. The bar doors swing back, noisily creaking to and fro to a near silent bar full of people. Near silence except for the poor man half dead on one of the tables, cursing and screaming about an eight foot tall beast with glowing green eyes. They had apparently run out from the forest on his driver's side, crashing into his pickup, which then sent it sliding out, off, into the opposite tree line before flipping down an embankment into a little holler. He had managed to escape just by a whisker, as a deer caught the beast's attention. He made a run for his life from behind some trees that he was hiding behind. The beast changed its mind once more, and he began chasing him down. As he crossed back over the road, a large truck slammed into the werewolf, a mere couple of feet behind him. The driver gave him a ride back to town but wouldn't stop so he bowed in the middle of the street outside. Whilst everyone was arguing and murmuring amongst themselves, I had an idea. It was a little bit crazy but what did I have to lose? Now was my time, I thought to myself. <coughs> I cleared my throat and said aloud, Good folk of this town, I know my face is not familiar, nor do you know my word is promised, but we do share something in common. I know of these creatures that reside here in the forests and swamps, but that is not why I am here. My name is John, redacted. I am a state bounty hunter, and I have been tracking a suspect across the nation. He is an extremely dangerous, and I have good reason to believe he is here, now, or at least he will be soon. But ladies and gentlemen, he isn't a regular Joe Runner. Something is wrong with this guy. Something completely unnatural. He's a... he's a real-life werewolf. I'm deadly serious and I want you all to be aware of what is coming. Everyone, please take my cell phone number. If you see a very large man with long dark hair, call me ASAP. And do not approach him. The room had now fallen silent, save for the rattling breaths of the victim clinging to his life. How do we know you ain't just another one of those folks who research Dogman and Sasquatch creatures? Said a large lady at the back of the bar. Yeah, how do we know you ain't here for some story or some bullshit? 
Ha ha! Goddamn werewolf my ass! added an old hunter behind me. I turned and addressed him. Because, sir, I have no interest in monsters or cryptids, whatever they call it. I hunt bad guys, and I get paid. Simple as that. I responded before placing my badge and ID on the bar in front of him. Hmm, the old boy said as he took a closer look. Well, okay then. He's a bounty hunter, everybody. He said aloud to the locals. So how are you going to catch this werewolf, man-wolf, whatever? He added. Well, sir, I was thinking of baiting him out of hiding. Problem is, how are the dogman going to react or the squatch? This is why I need you guys with me on this. I need to know what to expect from the dogman. I responded hoping that finally, now, they will begin to open up a little to the town's secrets. The return to Taylor, Mississippi. Without further ado, let's get straight into that. My request was met with mixed responses, many of the locals shaking their heads and talking amongst one another. I did, however, gain the trust and help of a select few. Some were truckers, whilst most were farmers, but all had one thing in common. Each one had either lost somebody or been chased or attacked by the dogman. Even a few were forced from their properties by the Sasquatch or the dogman. It was clear this really had been going on for a long, long time. The police didn't offer any real support as they would mysteriously lose any statements or connecting evidence. Regularly, they would arrive just as the beasts moved on. One man in particular was of more use than most. A young family man and a park ranger named Dean Lewis. Dean was reluctant at first but stayed to speak with me after some encouragement from his friends. It later was told to me that Dean had lost his kid sister in the winter a mere couple of months before. Nobody really knew what happened to her. She was in a group of five friends. As the group was walking along the roadside just outside of Taylor, there was a loud thud, and she was gone. Just like that, completely and utterly missing. There was no blood, there was no sounds, nothing. The remaining teens ran in different directions and scattered in pure panic. Two were found 14 hours later, cut up and bruised, but generally, okay. One of the boys was discovered torn to pieces and clearly fed upon. But unfortunately, authorities never located the other boy or Dean's sister. Dean told me of the pain of losing his kid sister, and never really being able to get over it or have any closure or justice. He said his peers silenced him for digging around too much and asking too many questions. Whatever you're planning, you'll need my help. I know this land like the back of my hand. I can show you the likely places of shelter this suspect could be hiding in, he said. That would be a huge help, Dean, but I can't have you with me on this one. The guy's too dangerous. I responded before he cut me short. I understand your concern, but I have to do this for my sister and the other kids. You'll need me out there. It gets pretty thick, and there's plenty of hollows he could be hiding in. What about the dogmen? I asked. His face went stone cold white at just the mention of them. That's the tricky part. You see, most of the time we cover the trail, camping areas, but not too deep into the forest. That way people don't go wandering out into the back country, never to be seen again. The dogman seemed to keep back there, save for the odd one or two younger ones. The rangers like myself are usually long gone before the sun is down, so we rarely cross paths. He replied with his hands sweating as he did so. What do you think they will do when they, or if they encounter Mr Chambers, the suspect and werewolf? I added, hoping that the answer would be slaughter him, but instead he replied, well, I don't know for certain, but I worry that they will see him as a new alpha, then turn on the entire town, population overnight, a pure massacre. We have to stop him before he gets to them, he said with a hint of true panic in his voice. I feared you would say that. Then it's settled. We go hunting first light. We raised our drinks and toasted the missing and the dead. The next day around 9am we all met in town. A small group of six hunters and my ranger friend joined me as we headed out deep into the forest surrounding the town of Taylor. It was pretty thick brush from the get-go as we traversed an incline down into a small holler. Hogweed everywhere snagging on my backpack and clothing. From ten minutes in to the hike it was clear that the usual forest ambience was non-existent. Just a quiet howling of wind winding its way through the trees and fissures of the rocks. Around what must have been two miles in and the smell hit my senses like a sledgehammer. Man, this funk was unbearable, and soon, making all of our eyes burn and water up, it was literally the worst thing I'd ever, ever smelt. 
Anyway, a short while later we came upon an old hunting shack. It had long been deserted and the door half hung on whilst weeds and Spanish moss wound their way through the holes and cracks in the wood. Some of the guys started to look more uneasy as we got closer to the shack. This is the Peters family shack, said Dean. They owned a lot of the land back here for many years going back to the 1800s, he added. What happened to them? I mean, are there any relatives in town with the rest of you? I asked. No, sir. They all but died out in the 90s, some of old age, others forestry accidents. I believe some of the younger members did move away over to California, but nobody was really ever sure, Dean replied. I approached the doorway to the shack and pushed the heavy oak door out the way, and it let out a loud creaking noise that any horror movie fan would be proud of. Leaning in and scanning the interior of my flashlight, I could see an old dusty workbench and a table with four chairs, and then a doorway through to what I assumed was the bedroom area was to the far left, off from me. As I scanned my light back to the table area, I noticed off in the opposite corner, clothing strewn across the floor. New clothing. I mean, it wasn't dirty or dust-covered. It was recently laid there. Then I noticed the scratches all up the walls and floorboards, long and deep, and my heart suddenly skipped a beat as it dawned on me. He was already here. These scratches were fresh. I glanced back at Dean and the others who were watching our six and scanning the tree line for any movement. Dean came over and peered in. Look, man, that cloven is new and so are all those scratches. He's already here, I declared. Oh, my God, responded Dean as he scanned the interior of the shack. Look there, he suddenly said, pointing to the cloves again. What? I asked. There, look, blood, and lots of it, he replied shakingly. Sure enough, near the pile of torn clothing was a huge puddle of blood with splatters all up the adjoining walls. Jeez, man. I reacted aloud, catching the attention of the guys behind us. One by one, the men came over and peered into the shack before staggering back in shock. Gents, it looks like our man, or whatever he is. Well, he's already arrived, and I'm guessing by the amount of blood that he's already killed something, or... I can't stay out here too late, said one of the younger men, Jerry. My, my wife. She's heavily pregnant, and I... I... It's okay, Jerry. We start heading back in a few hours, said Dean, trying to reassure the younger hunter who by now had lost all colour in his face. Here! Over here! I found something! shouted an old hunter by the name of Rick. He was just off to the side of the shack, a ways to the right. What do you got, Rick? asked Dean as we made our way over to where Rick was standing. He was in some chest-high brush kicking around at the ground. I'm not sure, but it could be a storage cellar. I don't know, though, Rick replied. We got over to where Rick was standing to see an old green steel cover over a wooden hatch. What the hell? said Dean at the sight of the strange and heavy cover. I never knew this was here, he added. I don't like it. I can't do this. I'm claustrophobic, said Jerry again looking more and more uneasy by the minute. Crack! A loud noise shattered the silence of the forest. Crack! Another from a closer position. Whatever it was, it was coming this way. We've got to move now, I said as we could see the tops of the trees, a hundred yards, maybe more, start to sway and move. Open it up, said Dean. Go, get in now, he added hastily. What's going on? I asked him as we struggled to shift the heavy steel cover off the hatch before climbing down into the inky blackness of the shaft, leading to God knows where. As I climbed down, I glanced back over to where the advancing noise was coming from, to see three enormous black as night itself dogmen spring from the canopy of the trees down to the ground, with a tremendous thud. Oh shit, shouted Dean and two other guys who had began firing on the creatures as they circled and bared their teeth. My god, it's true. They do exist, I said in part amazement and part terror. Their enormous build like that of a prime athlete. I mean muscle upon muscle, clearly defined through their heavy and thick coat of fur. Their hands were extremely disproportionate to the body, with fingers thick and long, tipped with razor-sharp black claws. But most strikingly of all, was their bright, glowing red eyes. At night, to witness those eyes staring back at you must have been bone-chilling, to say the least. Before I finally ducked my head below the surface, I see two of the dogmen work as a team to separate and corner one of the guys up against the shack as he gradually stepped further and further back into the wrong direction. Then both launched themselves almost in sync from 20, possibly 15 feet away at the guy. He managed to get a few rounds off, but it was useless as their sheer size almost mocked the bullet's impact. 
Crashing upon him, they began tearing into him like a damn Christmas present. I had seen enough and jumped the remaining steps into the blackness as they pulled the long bits of his intestine out of him whilst he kicked and squealed. Landing a few feet down in some unknown tunnel system, I heard Dean scream out, No! before suddenly jumping down onto the ladder and trying to pull the still door shut. Jerry, get up here and help him! I shouted, but Jerry was near catatonic, murmuring to himself low to the ground. Damn it, kid! I added before one of the older hunters jumped back onto the ladder and climbed his way back up to where Dean was desperately, desperately trying to slide the still cover shut. The guttural moans and roars of enjoyment from the surface echoed around us and through our bodies. A moment or two later, the man screaming and cries for help suddenly cut out. Dean and the hunter still struggled to fully close the cover when suddenly long black fingers clamped around the cover. They were trying to open it back up. They're trying to get in, screamed Dean before a long, hairy arm rushed in through the gap and grabbed the hunter by his throat. The look in his face I will never forget. As seconds later, he realised what was happening. Ah, no! screamed Dean as he desperately fought against the dogman trying to get in. Pop! Slop! There was a sudden loud popping sound followed by a wet tearing and slop. The hunter's head had been ripped right off of his body. Dean fired his pistol up through the gap, letting off six rounds, and the monstrous arm retreated with the head still in its clawed hand. Go! shouted the other men as Dean finally managed to slam the still cover shut with a loud echoing clang, leaving the violent creature scratching and banging and denting against the still with a tempo of psychotic rage. All right, let's keep moving. I don't know if that's going to hold them off or not, I said as I started to make my way down the long and dark tunnel. Old wooden support rims, much like that of a mining operation. It was soon clear to everyone that this wasn't a regular cellar or basement. It stretched on too far, into an unknown maze of shafts and chambers. Old books and crude made wooden furniture lay around the place where there were old bottles of whiskey covered in thick layers of dust. The ground beneath our feet was dirt and rocks, and with the same for the walls of the shafts. The faint sound of running water as a small stream flowed between our boots. Our steps loud and splashes in the water echoing around us. It was near pitch black, save for a few flashlights. The small, cramped environment was getting to Jerry more and more by the second, but we kept pushing him along with us. That smell? Hmm, that smell returned as we walked further and further into the maze. The shaft split into three separate tunnels, one of which felt like a warm breeze flowed out of. God, it smells like rotting flesh, one of the guys at the front said. Shh! said Dean, who was just behind them, with myself. Boom! A faint but definite sound pierced the tunnel from further in. What? asked the hunter, but it was already too late as two large green eyes revealed themselves behind the hunter. As he turned to speak to Dean, they rose up three, maybe four feet above the hunter as he slowly turned. When he finally turned around and saw what was behind him, a small squeak left his mouth and he dropped his rifle with a loud clatter. Without another second to pass, we all began firing, but it was too late as the huge werewolf slashed at the man's face, literally ripping his face from his skull, and then grabbed him by the arms and slammed him into the sports struts with a catastrophic effect. His whole head simply imploded on impact with the beam. The men started to panic and two ran off into the left shaft, leaving me, Jerry and Dean. We've got to go, and now! I screamed and threw a flashbang to the creature's feet. As we ran into the far right shaft, he was onto us. But the flashbang went off with an almighty crashing bang, collapsing the shaft above its enormous head and stopping him dead. Well, I hoped, but at least it gave us some time to find out a way out of this maze of tunnels. About an hour later, we came to a large chamber that had been long disused, and a table and a campsite with an extra large spit for roasting huge pigs. It appeared like much of this strange place, completely untouched for many, many years. An iron cell was dug into part of the wall, and along the outside there were a few sets of two-inch thick heavy chains bolted to the ground and walls. I grabbed an old dusty journal from the study and table in the far corner of the chamber. Blowing and wiping the dust off the surface, it had the words, The Lunar Bloodline. I didn't have time to turn even one page before the sound of heavy approaching footfall came rumbling from deep behind us in the tunnel. Dean, we gotta move. Where next, Ranger? I shouted at him. Your guess is as good as mine, he replied. All right, then. This way, look, another door. In the corner from the shaft we came through. 
There was another heavy green steel cover or door, and this time it was almost like the submarine watertight doors. Jerry and Dean tried it. Ah, it's jammed! Ah, I seized up! The thumping footfall was getting closer and closer and louder, and now was accompanied with a low growl and bellowing from within the inky darkness of the tunnel. I shone my flashlight into the tunnel towards the oncoming threat, and a faint set of green eyes were glowing back at me, bobbing up and down, up and down. Then, again, they rose high to nearly the roof of the tunnel. I noticed not only that, but the god-awful smell was back, and then the rhythm of the footfall changed. It was now clearly running by Peter as thud, 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 boomed down towards our location. We've got to go, guys, come on! The door, damn it! I screamed, and the werewolf responded with a roar that was so sinister, it made me shudder. Move, Jerry! I said as I pushed him out of the way. Keep your eyes on that son of a bitch! Trying the heavy handle once more with Dean, we heaved until it finally gave with a loud metal clank. Quick, inside! Now, Jerry! I said as Jerry stood frozen in place, his skinny, denim-covered legs shaking as a stream of piss ran out from the bottom of his trouser leg into the dirt. A deep and low, mmm, came from the tunnel in front of Jerry. Dean, grab the kid, let's go! Come on, kid! Come on! screamed Dean. He literally had to grab the kid and throw him into the open door. As he did, the monstrous werewolf emerged from the dark tunnel, now fully standing in front of us, cast in the strange light that our flashlights lay upon him. He showed his massive teeth, and with an almost human smile, he was enjoying this. I could see it in his green evil eyes. Myself and Dean soon jumped in behind Jerry and rushed to close the steel door. We only just managed it by a fraction of a second, as he slammed into the metal door, denting it immediately. The beast even managed to punch through the three-inch thick safety glass above the locks and began trying to open it back up. Shoot him! We screamed at the same time as his enormous hairy arm flowed around at the door, again our bullets seemingly pinging off of his thick skin. But eventually he retreated once more, but not before doing, I swear, the creepiest thing I have ever seen, ever witnessed. He just stopped banging and clawing and then leaned down close to the cracked hole of glass that he had just smashed through. He leaned in and just stared at me. Just me. He didn't seem to care for the other two. No. He knew I was here for him. And boy oh boy was he pissed. We locked eyes for what felt like hours and then Dean tapped me on my shoulder and said let's get going I found a passage. I kept my eyes locked with Bill Chambers and then nodded and tipped my hat. I'll be seeing you soon Bill. The beast snarled, once again showing those teeth. Up close, I could see the long scar, still evident on his right cheek, although now it stretched along his nasty, gnarly muzzle. He also had four long ass canines that protruded from the moor, each side two up and two down. His breath reeked of decay and blood, no doubt from the fresh killing and murders that he had just committed. I got up and left following Dean and Jerry down another tunnel. As we did so, we could hear the werewolf stomping away from the door back into the black darkness. This way, said Dean, grabbing Jerry by his collar of his shirt and moving him down the tunnel in front. Eventually, about 25 minutes later, we found an access ladder to the surface. Where it would lead us out to, I hadn't a clue. Plus, as we hit the surface, it was clearly still, way deep into the forest. And worse still, it was getting late and sundown would be creeping in soon and I'd guess we had two hours tops until the golden hour. Shit! We can't go strolling through the woods like it's a nice summer's evening, lads! Said Jerry, as he too realised the predicament we were now in. Well, we can't stay down here with him, and I'm running low on ammo. I got two more grenades and one more flashbang, and then we're out, I replied. So this was the cars that we were dealt. Lost miles out in the dogman-infested forest, sundown fast on our arse, and a damn psychotic, murdering werewolf hunting us down with apparently an obsession for myself. You see that high ground up there? said Dean, pointing to a cliff edge about a quarter mile away. Yeah, I see it. I responded questionably. We need to get up to that point so we can possibly see where the town is from here or at least gather our possible location, responded Dean. That's a great idea, buddy. I don't think we have any other better option. Let's do it. But guys, wait! said young Jerry, looking absolutely terrified. But nothing, kid, I said. It's either or, and I know you don't like dark, cramped spaces. 
Think of all that fresh air you could get up there. It's our best shot. Hell, our only shot. I added, with an unsure nod of his pale face, we gathered ourselves and made for the surface, for that cliff. God knows our nerves were on end, and the ambience and atmosphere was electric. Two hours tops to sundown. Two hours until they come hunting for us. On the surface, the forest around us was still silent and deadly, just the odd rustle of the leaves and the canopy above our heads. The journey up the steep incline to the cliff top was treacherous, as beyond words. We chose to follow a small game trail up the side that seemed to have a switchback halfway up, but instead we found the switchback impassable as a recent rock slide had now blocked our through route. We don't have time to head back again to find another way up, said Dean, climbing up on the top of a large boulder to peer around for a route over or through. No, nope, nothing. We're going to have to either go back down or try and go up from here. Dean announced from high up. Up? What does he mean up? Remarked Jerry. I think he's saying we free climb there. I responded pointing directly to the sheer rock face. Oh, I, I, no, no, I can't. Again, Jerry declared. You don't have a choice, kid. It's up or you can wait here for the sundown. Your choice. I know it's risky, but so is standing down here. I tried to reassure the young man, but it was no use. He was trembling with fear and couldn't make up his mind. The horizon already began to haze as the sun lowered in the sky. Eventually, after a good five minutes of myself and Dean badgering Jerry, he folded and decided to join our ascent. It wasn't much further up, and this would actually take some time off our estimated journey to the top. Dean went first, leading the way and pointing out the best footholds and grip points. Another thirty-five odd gruesome minutes we made it over the top and walked the remaining trail to the edge of the cliff. As we approached it, it was now hitting the golden hunting hour as the trees and everything all around was plunged into shadows and silhouettes right before true darkness takes hold of the day. The vast expanse of the park now evident from this elevated point, we could see off a ways in the distance. A good three or four miles plus was the town's church steeple high above the surrounding tree line. We'll never make it in a four miles back on foot through the night, said Dean, scratching his head in frustration. Is there not a ranger station we can make it to and hold up overnight? I questioned. Dean looked at me and then nodded and said, Yes, I'm afraid there is, but it's practically back no more than a couple of minutes walk from the tunnels. I see. Then it looks like we are walking through the night. We can't just stay here. He's already got our scent. It won't be long before he or the dogmen find us, I added. Dean stood hands on his head and then waist, shaking his head from left to right in disapproval. Okay, it's suicide, but so is waiting for that beast to find us. Let's do it. No flashlights and absolute silence, he demanded. I nodded and looked to Jerry on my left, who was just staring out across the vast forest below us. It will be fine, kid. We'll be back in the town in a couple of hours and back to that beautiful wife of yours. I said again, trying to boost the young man's confidence. He gulped loudly and glanced at me and then slowly nodded. Just then a mighty howl broke the early evening silence, followed by two more from across the forest, a mile or so away at a guess. We need to go. Now, gents, I added before we set off down the adjoining trail, back towards the town in the far horizon. Still, the wind whipped and howled as we hiked our way down another trail, not knowing what or who could be waiting, hiding for us. About an hour or so later, we were cresting a hill. As we did so, and looked down, there was a small clearing and a campsite haphazardly built into the side of a large boulder. As we got closer, it was apparent that whoever had been staying here was attacked and highly likely laying somewhere nearby dead. We took a closer look and could see large prints leading from the thick brush towards the tent, but from the side of it. Whatever got to them did so by ripping straight through the damn nylon lining and dragging the poor souls out back into the deeper brush. God, what a way to go, I muttered to myself. Inside the destroyed tent, however, was a sat phone, a couple of high-powered hunting rifles, ammo, some climbing apparatus and a couple of large machetes. We found a second body, not far from the first except this one had been partially buried, almost like a stash for another sitting. Getting full, huh, big guy? I again muttered to myself. We should get moving in case whatever did this decides to come back and finish said Dean quietly, as not to give away our presence. Jerry was just 
well, Jerry. He was standing, staring all around over his shoulder constantly. The damn kid gave me the willies, acting like a damn meerkat. Anyway, we trekked on further, noticing that still there was zero sign of wildlife around the trees. They're empty of squirrels and birds. The terrain taking a steeper incline with loose rocks and long grass, making the path treacherous as hell. But we managed to cover good ground, and in good time. The problem, however, soon dawned on us, as we realised we were heading into a deeper hollow and a part of the forest that was near dark throughout the day. Nope, was my first thought. Literally, I cannot stress how dark and cold it suddenly became as we climbed and slipped our way down the final part of the incline and headed into this dauntingly dark forest. Again, this is in the middle of nowhere. Now, I have tracked guys down over Germany, France and in the UK in the darkest, coldest environments. But this before us, and as we entered, seemed to seep through the layers of clothing and creep up your back, biting cold. Eventually, literally, I guess, too. Soon it was like someone had shut us in a capsule, or like when you first step into a car and close the door. The ambience. Also, as the heavy wind had seemingly stopped or couldn't permeate the dense trees and canopy, the atmosphere it was chilling. There was only our breaths and heartbeats in a quiet babble of water somewhere off a ways, and then Jerry went and stepped on a damn dead branch laying on the ground. It made an enormous crack. Dean and I looked at each other wide-eyed. Shit, I whispered, turning to Jerry. His face like a kid who had just broke the kitchen window playing football. Half stepped with his foot now raised just above the broken wood. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to, whispered Jerry. The noise must have carried a fair distance and echoed as it faded. Dean began raising his hand slightly up towards Jerry, as if to shut him up or something else. At first, I couldn't put my finger on it. Dean continued, and then began shaking his head, clearly not happy. I was about to say something, but then... Then I smelled it. Turning slowly, as possible, I looked over to where Jerry was still standing, perched like an idiot. Then I heard it. A deep rumble suddenly surrounded us, and just a few metres away, halfway up a tree with its black claws gripping to the trunk. A nasty, mean-looking male dogman. It had a thick run of hair up its shoulders and neck, almost like a mane, but more like a hyena. Its eyes just glancing at Jerry's back. Jerry had just heard it too, as he started to whimper, and his breathing was erratic. Dean moved slowly forward to Jerry, still with his hands up. I didn't know if that was for Jerry or the dogman, but anyway, he whispered to Jerry, Whatever you do, do not piss yourself right now. It's a male, and he ain't going to appreciate that. Jerry's eyes, watering and shaking body, limply nodded his head up and then down. Dean, still whispering, continued. Jerry, just start walking towards me, okay? Everything's going to be all right. Dean responded quietly as possible. The dogman moved into another position on the other side of the tree. Then, without a second to spare, it jumped down, landing just a few feet away from Jerry's back. Its hot breath breached the collar of his shirt. It leaned down, smelling him up and then down, eventually knocked his cowboy hat off his head. The whole time his eyes locked onto Jerry. Even so, my ass was blowing, and I couldn't control my hands as they began to shake, and my head was almost spinning with the sight before me. I took a deep gulp. I went to unbutton my pistol holster. Ooh-wee, it did not like that. An even louder growl, or I probably should say a roar, came from this thing. In an instant, I dropped my piece. Oh, shit! I cussed, and Dean's eyes glared at me as he shook his head at me and said, No good. It's too close. Jerry, by this point, was a mess, his legs shaking and then buckled beneath him. And the creature reacted to my error. But suddenly, out in the distance, deeper in the darkness... Something more terrible and more twisted responded to the roar it had just made. Oh, please, no. Not now. Not here. I muttered to myself again. The black dogman grunted a loud snort and then tilted its huge long snout up into the air and smelled for a couple of long seconds. Then it began taking an enormous breath and released the house so deep it painfully popped Jerry's eardrums. So now he was completely deaf. The huge dogman pushed Jerry over with its long arm and black fingers and then turned around. I, wasting no more time, grabbed my gun quickly, again off the ground. When, off in a distance not too far away, we could start to hear a tremendous rumbling or thumping with the breaking of big, big branches. 
It sounded like a damn freight train was coming through the forest. We need to go now. I think it's him. I said to both of them. Dean nodded and replied. Okay, slowly at first though, yeah? I nodded and we looked to Jerry, who was in pure terror. He hadn't even seen what was behind him yet. I think he was lucky, I guess, in that respect. Come on now, Jerry. Nice and slowly, you hear me? Dean told him reassuringly. My patience was tearing at the seams as the oncoming whatever it was got louder and louder, and the thumping was now definitely footfalls. The dogman now turned completely away from us and stood completely bipedal towards the direction of the noise. It seemed he too was completely caught off guard. His height, it was monstrous, an enormous eight plus foot, and again, pure lean muscle upon muscle. He had to have weighed 650 or 800 pounds plus. We saw this as our opportunity and Jer slowly began to walk towards us. We all paced backwards further and further, and just as we reached a bend in the trowel and our view was slowly getting cut off by the foliage, we saw him. He made a direct attack on the dogman, who was caught off guard as the sinister werewolf sprang from behind some thick foliage. Tackling the dogman, the two beasts roared out as they smashed into each other, and over and over, teeth and claws ripped and torn into the enemy's torso. Snarl so vicious that your own skin tried to get up off your body and escape the sound. They were pretty much matched in size too, so this wasn't going to be easy for the werewolf. No sir. As much as I would like to say that we had somewhere close by and watched them duke it out, we didn't. In fact, we found the source of the sounds of water and began following it onwards. Still, the carnivorous crescendo booming throughout the forest behind us. I'm not sure whether the werewolf spotted us or not, but we escaped and quickened our pace. In the turmoil, we hadn't realised the sun was setting, and now we had at best less than an hour until night fell all around us. We needed to get out of this holler or find somewhere to camp for the night. Picking up our pace a little, we were suddenly faced with three oncoming dogmen that appeared out of the trees in front of us, but they seemed more occupied with the commotion of the comrade behind us. As the dogmen darted through us and sending myself and Jerry tumbling down a slight embankment of long grass into a shallow flow of water, Dean managed to cover as they missed him entirely. It hurt like hell, but that should keep the werewolf busy or hopefully... They would kill it, I thought to myself. As they disappeared round the bends in the trowel, sending gravel and dirt flying up behind their powerful haunches, Jerry called to myself and Dean. We both clambered over to where he was at, as two dogmen came roaring from the bend, climbing and writhing all over this enormous werewolf. The beast definitely had the upper hand in strength, but the numbers kept up the healthy attack, as the third and fourth dogmen rushed out of the canopy and bounded over to the chaos of tooth and claws. Blood being sprayed and bits of fur floating through the air as these wild creatures and the abomination of the werewolf went toe to toe in and out of our view. Over here, look! Again, Jerry called. Looking to what he was pointing at, there was a small cavern set into the forest floor, and after a closer look it was one way in and one way out of fair. As much as we didn't want to spend the night out here, it looked like we didn't have much of a choice. At least this way, we had solid rock three sides of us. Myself and Dean agreed and quickly set about grabbing as much firewood and brush as possible before we all made our way down through the narrow fissure in the rock. Someone would have to go back out to get more later, but for now we considered this a win by all accounts as the screams echoed just around the corner and above. The sun had soon set and the ominous feeling set hard within our guts. The battle outside went on for hours and hours. Our heads ached from the sheer volume of the violence above our heads. But something else strange happened that I think only I noticed at first. During the chaos, around an hour or so after it had begun, the roars changed. I mean, not changed, but something or someone else joined the battle. I obviously couldn't be sure, but there was definitely another creature. You see, at the time we first encountered Bill Chambers as a werewolf, he made it, or it made it, I should say. It made a gurgling, guttural noise as it slowly stalked towards us, and its howl was almost more, more, well, more human-like, like someone screaming to their very death, a haunting sound, really. But the dogmen, their growling was similar, but more deep and canine. And when it howled, you felt your bones clash together, the very soil beneath your feet tremored. Anyway, I spent the rest of that night trying to work out what we were hearing, until it very suddenly stopped. It was around 12.45 and temperatures had dropped considerably. We did our best to cover the entrance with thick and thorny bits of brush and foliage 
and a couple of sleeping mats and some of the climbing ropes precariously holding it all in place above our heads almost. We laughed in the early hours that if the dogman or werewolf didn't kill us, it would probably be the heavy branches and bits above us falling onto our heads. As the chaos above suddenly stopped, there was a series of heavy footfalls in different directions, one in particular pausing just above us, right next to our hiding spot. Jerry was near having a seizure when he finally laid eyes on one of the dogmen, before it jumped and was gone from sight, slowly crashing off like the others into the forest. We sat there in silence for what felt like days. It was only a few hours, eventually having to light a fire as the cold started to really affect us. It was risky, yes. We had no choice at this point. Soon, the small fire was going, just enough to warm our feet and hands. It was working perfectly for an hour, maybe more, when out of nowhere, it was a big, heavy stomp, stomp, stomp. Oh, God, whispered Jerry, looking up to the hole above us. Dean leaned forward to get a better view, and I followed suit, trying to see what, and BAM! There it was. The werewolf's huge wolf head and piercing green eyes leaned in closer to the tangle of brush and leaves covering our hideout. Its black fur or hair catching the illumination of the fire. Its eyes, its eyes reflecting like torches. Oh, shit! I said aloud as this deep, booming growl exploded within the cave. The werewolf opening its mouth to reveal an arsenal of sharp, twisted teeth. It was just too big to get in, however. At least, that's how it looked. And that's how I prayed. It stared at each of us menacingly, its upper body clearly ripped to shreds, with massive wounds running in a pattern of four claws, saliva instantly drooling from its maw. Oh God, we're screwed, said Jerry, as he looked to Dean for an answer to this nightmare. He was going to need a miracle. Ah, oh, screw this. I said aloud as I raised my MP5 and shouted, Cover your ears, boys! And I began unloading hellfire to this sucker's face. It may not kill him, but I was going to do my best to hurt, maim or scar him before he killed us. I'm not going out. I'm not without a fight. Dean soon joined me and unloaded his judge, almost point blank, into the werewolf's open, snarling mouth. It must have worked as the shriek it made afterwards. Even Jerry heard. Bits of its jagged teeth shattering all over. Finally... It seemed to stumble back and then out of sight. Jerry still sat there, pistol in hand, not even managing to fire a round. I think he's had enough, kid. I said to Jerry to easily lower his weapon and take a breath before he passed out. It's funny. He reminded myself of a younger me. Foolish, clumsy, but he had a good heart. I too had a good heart long ago. I guess it got lost somehow along the way. After around ten minutes, we were hoping that it had enough and had moved on. Or, of course, the other scenario would be that it was out there, watching and waiting. My watch read 4.57am, so at least the dawning day's sunlight would soon breach the horizon and eventually this god-awful cursed forest. Neither one of us wanted to be the first out, but someone had to. And seeing as it was my gig, I had the short straw. Upon reaching just near the surface, I stopped and listened. It was quiet but there was a few bird songs tweeting away. Totally different to how things were only hours before. I signalled for the others to follow close, and we all one by one made our way back onto terra firma. We felt like lumps of meat just hanging there in a butcher shop window, and so we decided it had been long enough, and we must push on whilst daylight is on our side. We gradually made our way out of the deep holler and sinister dark forest and found ourselves at a clearing with an outlook. In the distance, we could now see the town. It was at least three miles to go, and somehow we had gone on a wide berth of the town and the surrounding forest. Hours later, and beaten and bruised, not to mention completely and utterly exhausted, we came to a small freshwater pond. Some deer, lazy laying in the sun rays, bathed and startled by a sudden presence, scurried and bounced away back into the deeper forests. Bang! 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 Gunshots rang out in the near distance. Myself and Dean glanced and then ran full pace towards the gunfire. Whoever it was, they had to be local. They might need our help. Hopefully, they can give us a ride back to town. Instead, what we found, around 20 minutes later, was complete, unbridled carnage. First, we thought it was another poor group of campers, as we could make out a large tent and a few others. Then we noticed the odd assortment of empty gallon bottles and distillery equipment and goodness knows what else. The smell hit us from way back, and soon, it was clear this was no campsite, but a damn meth lab. 
multiple bodies laid, torn to odds and ends, bloodied and heaped in piles all over the forest floor and surrounding trees. And Jerry blew carrots all over the place. I handed him some smelling sorts to cover the smell. I guess I had just become used to the rotting vegetable mixed with meat, bloody smell and taste. Dean remained with Jerry, keeping an eye on the outside whilst I went into the main tent to investigate further. Inside, I found some keys to the ATVs round back, but not much else was useful. I did, however, grab Jerry a big old stack of dollars. Had to have been a hundred grand easily, give or take a few thousand, but I thought his little family could use it better than it just sitting out here and rotting. I was just about to leave and check in the other tents and the ATVs when I spotted some more fresh blood. It was on the floor but disappeared as it got to the back end, underneath a big old storage trunk. Hmm, I remarked to myself. What do we have here? I added. Aiming my pistol, I kicked the trunk out of the way to reveal another secret trapdoor hatch. I called for Dean and Jerry to come and check it out, but before I could finish my sentence, the hatch flew open and two long, huge, hairy arms came reaching out straight for me. Jerry managed to swing his machete straight down and threw the beast's right arm as it rose up and out of this hatch. It howled a loud and painful howl that was cut short by Jerry once again cutting into its head with a sickening crunch. Jeez, Jerry, buddy. Thank you, man. You goddamn saved my ass. I said amazed at the moment Jerry had decided enough was enough. Either that or he just lost the plot altogether. It was a damn meth head, crack head, werewolf. I mean, for the love of God, as if it wasn't bad enough already. It looked like Bill Chambers had now started to infect the not-so-local population. It took another five minutes of all three of us hacking into this creature's head and face before it finally collapsed. I swear to you. His damn jaw was still gurning from all the drugs pumping through the system. What a damn nightmare. Anyway, we found some jerry cans of fuel in the hidden room where it was hiding, and checked the ATVs to make sure they had fuel and was working. Just before we hit the road, we doused the meth lab with fuel setting it ablaze. Uh, if you know anything about meth labs, it's that they're really flammable. Hoo-wee! Kaboom! We hit the damn trail hard, each red line in our ATVs trying desperately to leave this forest as fast as possible. Within minutes of us hitting the old logging road long forgotten by the residents of Taylor, we were being followed from both sides. Loud growls and yips could be heard accompanied by the ever-present smashing of branches and roots. As an unknown number of dogmen chased us, even on a horrendous dirt road, we still averaged a good speed of 55 mile per hour, but they still maintained to stay hot on our tails. Over the noise of the three loud four-stroke engines, I could just hear young Jerry screaming to himself in pure, undiluted terror. Soon, the bordering fields and town were rolling up on the horizon, and I pushed the ATV even harder, now with two gigantic male dogmen running alongside me. One of them reaching out to hold onto the ATV's back wheel arch. I swerved into it with a huge thump, and sent it tumbling head over heels into its buddy, with enormous creatures knocking through the side tree line, like bowling pins, shattering and splinters, and wood and foliage everywhere. I looked over towards Jerry and I could see another two more emerging from the tree line to his right. He was too busy just keeping a vehicle on the road so I had to take a shot. The problem was, we were near an bend, and there wasn't much time or room for any mistakes otherwise. Jerry might lose his face. Jerry! I screamed above the crashing and roaring of our engines. Jerry! He glanced this time and I pointed to his right. He took one look and freaked out. His ATV began sliding all over the place and then almost rolling. I saw my opportunity and fired off a few bursts of my MP5. It seemed to hold them off, and thank goodness. Jerry got a damn grip as we reached the fields and the tree line cleared out each side of us. There was at least five, maybe six of these black creatures racing towards us, some on all fours like a wolf or dog, others bipedal, in broad daylight. They didn't intend on letting us escape, and this was their final opportunity. If they were going to get us, now was it. 500 metres of the first bit of blacktop road. 350 metres. Scrape. A huge dogman took a mighty slice out of my ATV. 200 metres. In doing so, it had cut my fuel line, and suddenly I realised my power was diminishing. I shouted to Dean to come closer. I was going to have to jump to his. 100 metres. I jammed the gas pedal down with a hiking cane, and then I jumped for Dean's ATV, just missing the hungry mouths and sharp claws of the dogmen trying to grab at me in mid-air. The ATV was now ghosting alongside us, I pulled my judge out and fired a quick burst of shots straight at the gas tank. With an almighty boom, it exploded, and in seconds it downed three of the beasts stalking us. 
We hit the smooth black top and I looked back to see the creatures coming to a stop one by one, their huge frames sliding in the dusty dirt. That was too close, said Dean. Yeah, I know, brother. I know. Let's get the kid to his wife and get some damn whiskey, I added with a slightly hearty chuckle. Dean joined me as we made our way into town, both with huge waves of relief. As the regular folks of old Taylor looked at us, we bombed through the streets covered in dirt and blood. Finally, after a lifetime it seemed, we were able to leave Jerry and his lovely wife and head to the bar for that damn drink. And boy did we drink. I mean, not just your average, oh, I need to forget about the girl or oh, I just lost my job kind of drink up session. No, I'm talking about wrecked. We ended up bribing old Dan the landlord to let us have a lock-in until the early hours. Around 1am I remembered the journal from the underground room. Dusted it off on the table and myself and Dean began going through the jotted notes and some of the formulas for apparent cult practices or rituals. Some of it was sick and twisted to be honest. Speaking of deals with demonic entities to human sacrifice. Anyway, a short while later I turned the page and detail before me was a family tree. Well... Actually, it was two family trees, the first being that of the Peters family, the other of that, at a guess, the Dogman Pack in the forest. Within the notes, I read how back in the 40s the town of Taylor was overrun with these dogmen. They were snatching children from their beds. Many hikers went missing, but seemingly most of all, hardest hit was the forestry woodsmen. The loggers would go in, in groups of six, maybe more, most never to be seen or heard of again. As the town grew more and more concerned by the day, it appeared that the father of the head of the Peters household decided drastic action had to be taken. Now, with the help of his cousins, they called on the dark elements for assistance and was granted the strength of ten men and ten wolves. Unfortunately for Father Peters and his cousins, the power granted to them was too powerful and Mr Peters transformed without any warning and laid slaughter to his entire family. That was all except for a young, newborn baby, who had yet to be named. Later down the line, I did some more research and found this young life was then whisked away by authorities and placed into the care system, where he would eventually grow up and be adopted. Adopted under the family of the Chambers household. Bill Chambers was the last surviving member of the Peters family. He must have contracted the werewolf disease that fateful night. The next morning was as expected, met with troubled residents wanting to know what was happening. Oh, and a hangover my student self would have been proud of. I mean, my tongue literally grew hair, or at least that's how it felt. <laughs> we grabbed some strong coffee and headed out of the bar into the blinking daylight of the high street. A police responder car came screeching around the corner of Old Taylor Road, bleaching the tyres and roaring its engine towards us, and then he went straight past. Dean and I looked to one another, baffled. This doesn't look good, I remarked to him. Come on, let's go and follow. He replied, and we jumped back into the ATV and screeched our way back into the road and in the direction of the police responder units. Rounding the end of the high streets and coming to the town square, we realised what was going on as our hearts sunk into our arse. There, atop of the old clock monument, was the town mayor, Mr Roberts, his body impaled upside down on the top spire of the clock his insides left dangling in the morning breeze. There was a group of horrified onlookers gathered around as the officials tried to contain the scene, raised voices and crying accompanying the warm morning sun. This town, whether it liked it or not, had to admit they now had a very real issue. As to who was responsible, was it the dogmen or was it him, the werewolf? I don't know. Officials didn't want to work with us and even though we gave them everything we had and just found out and witnessed, to be honest, I felt they knew this was coming a long time ago. Now, to get this over with, once and for all. Question was, how was I going to lure him to where I wanted him? I needed bait. No, I needed live bait. Jerry, I said aloud to myself. What's that, bud? asked Dean. Oh, nothing, brother. But I think I know how we're going to get him to come to us right where we want him. I replied, reaching into my pocket and pulled out my pack of smokes and lit a cigarette. Where's the hardware store? We have got some traps to build. The Return to Taylor, Mississippi. Let's get straight into that.
the day that we found the town mayor crudely displayed, almost medieval to the town's people, we finally got the recognition that something had indeed changed. Something had brought an evil so ancient to Taylor that even the dogmen were uneasy. After speaking with some of the local sheriffs, I learned that over the last week or so, after dark, some of the surrounding fields had been filling with deer and various other fauna. The hills in the forest night air stifled with an overwhelming feeling of anxiety or fear. Several young and old people had been rushed to hospital with extreme distress and paranoia, some even having panic attacks. As every night leading up to my arrival, and since the night was filled with long haunting howls, one official even going as far to say that he knew of the dogmen. His father had raised him to watch the trees when in the woods, not to follow strange calls or noises. Well, he added that three separate residents that live in the remotest parts of the outer limits bordering the fields and forests of Taylor. They had all called into his station to report numbers of large dog monsters, devil dog monsters in the fields, almost like a pack, like they were preparing for something or were scared of something in the forest. Surely they're not scared by anything, I had thought to myself. I was given full access to the gun store stock whilst escorted by the sheriff. We asked the store owner to smelt down some high grade silver into shot and we mixed these with the dragon's breath shells and fully kicked out grenades. Armour piercing ammo, the works. I was starting to feel better already. We made our way over to the hardware store and grabbed what we needed. The plan was simple enough. We'd draw him to us and get him right where we need him. Trap him momentarily so we can get in close and finish the job. I planned with Dean to set up multiple trenches with upturned stakes in the bottom. If we could immobilise him, impale him on the thick stakes, maybe, just maybe, we could move in and turn his ass to Swiss cheese. Not forgetting that a couple of explosives should completely decimate him. We finished up and gathered another small team of men and one woman. I soon was told that she was the local historian, Izzy, and had a natural passion or flair for the occult. I greeted the guys and went over to speak with Izzy. I wanted to know if there was anything that we could do to even the odds, or if she could somehow attract the werewolves to the barn, and eventually to us. Izzy explained it was very risky, as it was almost like saying welcome to all werewolves close by. Like a lunch bell, I added humorously, to which she didn't see the funny side of my joke. Yes, like a lunch bell, for idiots. She responded, but eventually she agreed to perform another type of blood ritual, using mine and Dean's blood. In doing so, we would hold a bond to the land, and ancient ancestors would begin to whisper menacingly, taunting the werewolves louder and louder as if right inside their minds, and keep harassing the two werewolves, driving them mad, and eventually driving them out of the deep forest to where we needed them. At the old barn, where it all began. With us being linked to the land, like this, using the same barn, it would be like a great beacon to the werewolves, they won't realise it, but they will be willingly running towards their own doom. This time, we knew what to expect. This time, we were playing for keeps. The local pastor paid us a visit as we gathered at the town square, preparing ourselves. Final kit checks and communication checks. All was set. He went about blessing each of us and our equipment. I mentioned the old series of documents that I'd found, and he nodded his weary head and said, Yes, yes, I have often wondered when this day would finally show itself. I remember the years when the creatures first appeared. Such dark times. So much sadness and loss descended upon the good people of this town. I also remember my father trying desperately to talk with him. Who? I asked, intrigued. The old pastor took a moment, almost seemingly travelling right back to the time he was speaking of. His eyes glazed over and asked again. Who do you mean, pastor? He sighed again. Ah. Oh. I am talking about Mr. Peters and his cousin, dear boy. I take it you read that far? Yes, I answered. It details the family taking drastic and catastrophic measures to try and rid the town's plight with the dogmen back then. Ah, uh, yes, the dark elements were called upon, and a gruesome end was met by all. All except the boy and one other, he added. I'm sorry, Pastor, but one other. I was under the impression the whole family was cut down in one night. The young baby whisked away from the scene and taken across the country. I responded, looking more than puzzled. But he added another spur of mystery to this operation. Ah, I see. Then there is much that you do not know. Firstly, only the authorities and a few of the woodsmen are aware of its presence out in the surrounding fields and forests. 
You see, my dear boy, on the night of that demonic calling, Mr. Peters and his cousin, a man named Victor Peters, were eldest in the family, and so it was only them who would be privy to the ceremony. As the rest of the Peters family slept in the home on the family's farm, the two men made their way into the nearby forest to an old disused barn used for cattle, etc. The reason for this, I assume, as it was fairly strong in its structure compared to the other ones. Anyway, once inside of the barn, they began the rituals, each making blood sacrifices to the chosen demonic sire. They shackled themselves to the structure and commenced the ritual rites. Unknown to the baby's father, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chambers, is it? He questioned. Yes, that's correct. He was adopted into the Chambers family, I replied. Yes, uh, well, unknown to the father, but his cousin Victor had not closed his shackles, and so they received their new power and began transforming. A moment where both men would be, no doubt, incredibly vulnerable. Cousin Victor unshackled himself and drew a long dagger from somewhere close to him, and then plunged it into the chest of Mr. Vickers, killing him near instantly. That night he would escape out into the wilderness, never to be heard of or seen again. Many of us believed the killer had taken him with him, or something more terrible. But when authorities discovered the post-mortem results, suggestions was it was indeed murder. Soon the town mayor, Mayor Roberts, insisted it was kept quiet, as so it didn't worry the town's good people. Many years passed, and then the odd groups of campers or hikers would start to go missing, or found mutilated. It was him. He was lurking in the forest or along Old Taylor Road for anyone who might be stranded from a breakdown or whatever. Prowling, tugged in the weak or alone and waiting for any opportunity to feast. I looked at the pastor's weathered face in disbelief. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but it all made sense somehow. If this was true, then could it be that they have reunited at last and now plan a coup of the town's people? Killing those who stand against them and infecting those who don't or, as I would suspect, feel that they had no choice. I... I can't let this happen. I said to the pastor, angry, that the authorities and officials hadn't taken him out sooner, if they were aware he was picking off people who strayed too far from the town or too deep into the forest, especially if they'd stayed after dark. Someone should be held responsible, but you know as well as I, that ain't happening. Not in this lifetime, at least. The pastor nodded in agreement, I thanked him for his blessings and speaking with me, and he went on his way again. We loaded up and headed out to get the traps ready. The plan was more than risky. I hadn't accounted for two werewolves, but I was confident it would work. We just needed to draw them out. As we drove out of town towards the fields, we stopped to pick up Jerry. The other two trucks of guys going on ahead to get things ready. We were going to make multiple ground traps in several different locations, bordering the forest, particularly the old cattle barn where the ritual was carried out all those years before. My money was in that being our best shot, as the powerful energy used in the ritual had a bond or link to that location. Anyway, we got out of the truck and walked up to the small red block pathway to Jerry's front door of his family home. The doorbell played a cheerful tune as his beautiful wife answered looking ready to burst. She was so far gone. Hi Susie, said Ding. Is Jerry around, sweetheart? She looked over at me suspiciously, and then smiled at Ding. Sure thing, Ding. I'll just get him. She replied, before turning and disappearing into the house once more. A short time later, Jerry answered looking more than worried. Hi, Jerry. Myself and Dean said. Listen, this is... This is kind of difficult. Is there somewhere a little more private that we can talk? I asked him. Yeah, sure, this way. Responded Jerry before stepping out of the door and walking us around to the back of the property and down to his old barn. Listen, I'm done. Before you try and tell me we're going back to get that thing. I'm not, fellas, said Jerry, before I had even a chance to ask him anything at all. Look, we know you're scared, Jerry. Hell, we are too, and for good reason, buddy. But you got a family now. Did you really want your kid growing up around here with that thing out there? I added. He's right, Jerry, said Dean. It's worse than we thought. There's two werewolves. It's a long story, and one we will explain to you. But we need you on this, Jerry. I added as Jerry looked at us with worried eyes. Okay, but what have I got to do? He responded. Well, Jerry, it's really quite simple. We're going to draw them out and lead them to a trap where hopefully we can immobilise them and move in for the kill. So you mean you want me to be bait? He replied shocked and slightly pissed off. No, Jerry, we're all going to be bait. 
With two of them, we're going to really need to piss them off to get them to follow us. And what if they catch us before then? Then what, huh? He added angrily. Then, kid, it's up to you or I to pull a pin on the grenades and shove it so far down her throat. It's got more than heartburn to worry about after eating your ass. You've got to do this for your kid, man. Your beautiful wife. Do it for yourself, otherwise. They're just going to come to town one night and slaughter everyone who stands against them. I said hoping this would be enough to convince him to help us. Jerry walked off over to the old rickety wooden fence that looked out across the field towards the tree line and the dark forest beyond. He was right here last night, Jerry said quietly under his breath. What, kid? I responded. I said he was here, right here last night. He replied whilst pointing out two sets of long claw marks along the fence in front of him. I was checking everything was locked before bed and he was just standing here, staring straight at the house. When he saw me behind the curtains, he pointed his damn claws at me and drew his thumb under his neck like, I'm going to cut your throat. I didn't know what to do, so I just closed the curtains again and went to bed with my shotgun. When I awoke this morning, I checked on the horses in the stables. Oh, God. I muttered, knowing what was coming next. They're all dead. Every single one. All seven horses dead, with their throats ripped out. I haven't said anything to Susie yet. I don't want to panic her. But the smell is already kicking up from down there. She will know soon enough. Damn, kid. I'm so sorry. You've got to take a stand. I will kill them, kid. I just need to get them where I need them. I promise. I said, hoping this offered some comfort to him. Yeah, me too, Jerry. I get a couple of the guys to help you out tomorrow and clear them out. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. I did Dean patting Jerry on his shoulder. Let's get going then, gentlemen. We have a couple of dogs to put down. I declared before turning and heading back to the truck. We made our way back out to the long stretch of country road that cut straight through the fields. Long grass either side of the road towering up over the truck windows. It's no wonder it gets so dark out here at night. In a car, it would be like driving through a tunnel of darkness. Some of the fields high with corn ready for harvest. It was literally perfect for a dogman or werewolves to ambush people who got stranded or drove too slowly. I imagined the countless missing person reports that I'd already heard in a region over the years. It was now so easy to picture them driving down the winding country road, possibly coming to a complete stop as an apparent animal was dead on the road, the headlights illuminating long beams of light through the foggy evening darkness. They would step out of the vehicle and walk closer, trying to decide what to do or what it is. Then, well, you know the next part. They would be set upon and dragged into the cornfield, off into the darkness. A shudder ran its way down my spine as I thought of all of this. And soon, we pulled off the country road and into a dirt road, if that's what you want to call it. I mean, it was more likely compared to a classic Hollywood movie, a horror movie, in the woods. Within seconds, we were consumed by thick trees and brush as we cut our way through to rendezvous with the other members of the crew. The sunlight diminished considerably by the canopy engulfing our vehicle. Some minutes later, the horrendous road cleared out and we could make out the other truck through the dense trees. Then, as we rounded a bumpy-ass turn, the derelict old Peter's family barn stood, looking still strong, although years old. They don't build stuff like this anymore, I remarked to the guys trying to lighten our imprisonment of dread ever building within our guts. The other team had nearly already dug out the first few traps. We had agreed to try something more traditional, and improvised a number of Apache foot traps with snares. Also, we would rig grenades to the snare lines. If that didn't finish them off, then we would also be unloading Hellfire with the blessed hybrid silver dragon breath shells. And my goodness me, if that doesn't work, I will just have to cut their cursed heads off. If we can get them stuck and set off those snares and grenades, I think we'll be within a shot. Huh, no pun intended, gentlemen, I said, glancing up at Jerry in my rearview mirror. He turned to face me looking tense, but didn't voice it at all. He agreed and turned to look back at his window as we finally pulled up and got out. Myself and the boys unloaded the truck and made our way inside the old barn and started covering the walls with fresh hog's blood and deer urine. Then trailed that to the tree line, leaving no patch spared within a couple of hundred yards. The smell was insane as the sight. As men stretched out across the open field and walked up and down spraying the irony mixture. Until the tree line before turning and returning once more. It seemed as the word spread around Taylor of the crooked mare's demise and the impending threat of the werewolves. That more and more people came to assist. Farmers from far and wide bringing more and more blood offered their assistance. Soon... 
we would find out why. As a brave man, also a farmer named Big J came to see me, pulling up in his huge white bronco and tipping his hat to me. I hear you're looking to finish the wolfman for good. I hope you know what world of pain you're getting yourself into. He said, then leaned out slightly and spit in his chewing tobacco on the ground in front of me, grinning from ear to ear. Is that so, brother? Well, I mean, you're right about one thing. I am in for a whole new world of pain, but I'm taking that damn wolfman's head with me. Are you here to help or just wanted my time? I fired back with rage in my chest. Who the hell does this arsehole think he is? Big J laughing out loud, opened his door to his jacked up bronco and jumped out. Oh, so you got it all worked out, huh? He replied. I was too busy not laughing in his face after we jumped out of his mini monster truck. And I see how short he was. Literally, he couldn't have been taller than four and a half feet. Best five. I was expecting a huge man to step out of this huge truck. But instead, redneck Tom Cruise did. Oh boy. Anyway, soon he and I calmed down and got talking. Big J went on to explain that he lived over in Water Valley, a close neighbour to Taylor. And had nearly lost everything one evening the month before. He claimed that the day of the attack of his family's farm, he was feeling sick and uneasy but couldn't figure out why. He kept looking to the tree line but never saw a thing. Then, that night, as his family slept, and he couldn't, and so he got up for some water, he had made his way to the upstairs landing at the top of the staircase. He looked again towards the trees and this time, he was glad he did. Creeping low at first was a figure seemingly gliding through the long grass in a field opposite his home. It caught his attention instantly, although it was discreet. His awareness that day saved his family and his life that night. As he was watching the figure, it got halfway across the field before suddenly it stopped. Jay leaned closer to the window, cup in his hand to gain a better look. Without warning, the figure strangely jumped up into the air by ten feet at least and landed a further twenty feet ahead, closer to the home. It jumped again and again until eventually he could see what it was. It was a nightmare born of demonic power, and now it was coming for his wife and kids. Inside the old home was a connecting sub-basement, long since used and partially hidden behind some drywalling panels. If I could be quick, I could get them in there, and maybe he won't find them, Jay thought to himself. Quickly he raced around the home, waking his family from their slumber and grabbing the younger children as they all ran for the sub-basement downstairs. As Jay left the bottom of the stairs following, close behind his wife, he took one last look and see it smashing through the fence that surrounded his driveway. He only had seconds, if a minute at most, to get down to the sub-basement and hidden. With the children sobbing and confused at the drama, they made it just in time to hear the front room window implode as it came crashing straight through the glass with a loud thud. As the children were shushed and encouraged to hide, Jay and his wife looked up to the floorboards as each heavy bipedal step the werewolf made. Huge pieces of dust and dirt fell from the cracks in the boards and the beams. Jay's wife gasped loud. The walking upstairs instantly ceased. Go, get in, Jay whispered as quietly as possible. His sweet wife, with tears streaming down her face, shaking her head in disapproval. I'll be fine. I love you, he again whispered. The loud thuds of another step boomed again, and then... All hell broke loose as it began roaring and smashing the home up, ripping through walls and sides. The heavy thumps ran up the stairs, thump, 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 before enormous sounds of the bedroom doors being ripped off or kicked through. Long claw marks almost with a span of 22 inches trailed the walls upstairs as the werewolf had searched for all of them one by one. Minutes later, they all froze once more as the sound started to come back down the stairs. And eventually... The basement door crashed open and came clanking down the steps in bits and pieces. The werewolf's heavy breathing is all that could be heard as they all sat cuddled, holding their breath, waiting for whatever came next. Thump, thump, thump came its steps, and now the clacking of its long claws could be heard accompanying the thuds. All I could do was pray and pray, hoping to God the kids didn't make a sound. We were a good distance away in a separate crawl space, Turned storage room, but all I could think is, if you can hear our hearts, as they jump in our chests, or the sweat that now was dripping from my head or all over my back. Shh! I motioned with my hand to the kids, and then the damn whisper started. Whisper? I asked, confused. Yes, whisper. Jay replied and went on further. As he started to look around, like, started sniffing really loudly and 
grunted this strange grunt mixed with a squeal. Man, it was creepy as hell. Well, if it couldn't get any worse, I started to hear this persistent whisper in my head or whatever. But it was sending me insane. As strange and gruesome images flashed before my eyes, I could hardly maintain my silence as white-hot pain surged through my head. And torrents of whispers got louder and louder, and then it stopped. I can't tell you how long we were there or how long he was. But I opened my eyes to see my wife and children, pale white and panicked, but otherwise okay. I had apparently blacked out, but not before I did something to the werewolf. I have since learned that I am of ancient native bloodline, and my family have fought these beasts, these wolfmen, for hundreds of years at least. As shamans or hunters. Hey, I was as stunned as you probably are. He finished before once again turning to spit his tobacco out. So will you help us now, Jay? I then asked. I'm here, ain't I? He joked before we set about finishing the setup and heading into the forest as night began to fall. Twenty-five good men went into that foreboding forest, while Izzy and three men waited and prepared for our guests. The plan was pretty straightforward. We would spread out like a search team, but on dirt bikes. Myself and Dean at the front right, Big Jay and Jerry front in the left. I figured that eventually, either we would find them, or more likely, they will find us. We needed to hold them off and draw them out of the forest, hopefully with at least amount of casualties as possible. It was high risk, but somehow better than sitting and waiting for them to come to us. It was time to take the fight to them. Something I'm sure they never expected. The forest was completely silent, save for the roar of the bikes. About ten minutes into the forest, I could smell them. I couldn't see them, but sure as hell, it's hot. I could smell that putrid, rotten-blooded smell. It left a foul, metallic taste in my mouth that I couldn't seem to shift, no matter how much whiskey I swigged. We didn't have to wait long, though, before the dogmen appeared alongside us. I would catch glimpses and flashes of them as they ran through the trees like they were twigs. But even as panicked as some of us were to the dogman's arrival and presence, it was soon clear they weren't going to attack us. At least, not yet. Either they wanted to help or possibly needed our help. Either way, we shared a common threat. One that would upset the food chain and natural order of the land. Very abruptly and seemingly from nowhere the forest became very dark, and the sun still hadn't set, but was close. Yet here in this particular section of forest, it was nearly pitch black. One by one we turned on our headlights as the bikes tore and weaved through, in and out of the dead fallen limbs and thick brush. Q werewolf howling. Out of the dreadful darkness came a sickening long scream or howl. We all slowed our dirt bikes to a stop and listened as the howl faded out slowly. Waiting for any sign of the second werewolf, but none came. It sounded close, about 500 yards give or take, and moving fast as the crashing and creaking of the trees and brush were ripped out of the ground like toothpicks. Out of the dreadful darkness came a sickening long scream or howl, and we all slowed our dirt bikes down to a slow pace and then finally stopped, listening as the loud howl faded out again, waiting for any sign of the second werewolf, but none came. It sounded close, about 500 yards give or take, and moving fast as the crashing and creaking of tree limbs and brush were being ripped out of the ground like toothpicks. Let's get ready, gentlemen. Fire at will. Look after the man beside you, and he will do the same. And let's pray. We will make it home when this is over. Either on two feet or in a goddamn pine box. For Taylor, for your wives and children. Are you with me? I screamed across the dark, foggy forest to the men. Revving the shit out of my bike, we waited for that glimpse of where he was. And oh boy, did we get it. A couple of minutes later, with the sounds of his arrival getting louder and louder, his huge breaths as he sucked in air to his powerful werewolf lungs, bounding and smashing through the brush and trees. Bam! There he was. As he jumped through the last few trees between us and thick, impenetrable foliage and trees, he landed with one hand on the ground. Slowly, he raised himself up to stand full height. Nobody moved or said anything until I said, Hey, you, yeah, you, damn demon's little bitch. How does it feel to kill your cousin, only to be cursed to hell for eternity? Before letting off my new improved Benelli M2 automatic shotgun, filled with the Blessed Dragon Breath silver compound, I shot straight for this ugly face, watching the glowing hot silver and lead tear into his cheek and neck. Now, he was pissed. Without a second of spare, everyone began firing upon him as he roared and turned to look at this outrageous defence by the common men of Taylor, Mississippi. 
Before we could begin to lure him, he managed to grab a couple of the guys closer to him, launching two against the trees with a sickening impact and immediate death. A couple more of the guys just ripped and torn to pieces. We wasted no more time and were headed back towards the traps. He was soon following hot on our heels when suddenly the dogman joined us again and began chasing him down. Often we stopped and he would be wrestling around for a moment before snapping the neck of the dogman or tearing our arms off and biting their throats out. Then he continued his pursuit of us. Five minutes later, Bill Chambers showed up. Well, the werewolf version of him. And he too burst from the canopy jumping onto the dogman that was attacking Victor and once more killing it stone dead. Victor took Bill's hand and Bill helped him back up. And then they turned to look at us, snarling and growling the deepest tone I think I've ever heard. More howls rang out in the distance as more dogmen were on their way. I grabbed my two-way radio and called through to Izzy to start the damn ritual already. And with that, seconds later, a mighty wind came howling and blustering through the trowel from behind us towards the two werewolves. Immediately, they started to twitch their heads and then stumbled forwards towards the barn and traps the direction behind us. And then the screaming started. Oh man, it was so damn haunting, like a thousand souls all at once yelling for dear life. Victor looked up fast from his stupor straight at me. I smiled and said, Surprised? Come and get me then. And with that, Victor and Bill roared an enormous roar that shook the ground around us. Come on now! I shouted to the guys before redlining my bike and popping a willy out of there. We now had their attention and the ritual forcing them our way. We flew through the forest at breakneck speed, hitting jumps and tearing through brush as we could finally see the barn in sight. By now, it was pitch black out of the forest too. An old town of Taylor, Mississippi glowed with its lights off in the near distance. Leaving no time, I jumped off my bike and was joined by everyone else, Dean and Jerry. Big Jay and Izzy, out in front of the huge wind-battered open barn doors. Slowly, a minute or two later, the enormous abomination stumbled out of the tree line, no longer posing such a threat as the ritual's whisper held them firmly in its grip. As they approached, we opened fire on them and they carried on trying to desperately tear one of us to shreds, but could never grab out in time before having a gun shoved in their face and hot lead fired down their throats. It's working! I shouted, and gradually they were forced closer and closer into the barn as we manoeuvred around them, still pumping them full of lead. Finally, Bill was the first to step into the small trap in the ground, as the sharp barbs inside shoved into his huge werewolf leg and straight into his calf. As the sharp barbs inside shoved into his huge werewolf leg, and the right leg soon followed, Victor realised what was happening and made one last attempt to escape and jumped straight through the damn roof. Shit! I shouted as we ran around trying to catch him. As we did, the grenades rigged to the snares finally went off and exploded, Bill's werewolf legs off at his hips. We made the turn around the corner to see the other werewolf, Victor, had stopped, no longer trying to escape. Still in anguish at the ritual's torrents, yes, but his attention was drawn elsewhere. Looking up and around towards the fields and Taylor in the distance, Victor's enormous frame slightly silhouetted in Taylor's glow. There were red eyes everywhere. I mean everywhere. As far as I could guess, there were easily 70 sets of big red glowing eyes all looking at Victor. I gulped loudly. Some of the men I could hear muttered that it was time to go before they scurried away back to their trucks. A couple even left their damn dirt bikes dropping them where they stood only seconds before. Victor stepped back once more. Was he scared? Does a werewolf even have any emotions? He took another step and as luck would have it. One of the guys had placed some other Apache ground traps around the back end of the barn in case they tried to smash straight through to escape. Victor made a final step and his leg suddenly fell into the trap. Again, as he struggled, the wooden barb stabbed into his mighty werewolf calf and foot. His howl was deafening. In the Dogman pack, the true full pack, not just a few soldiers, but all of them slowly crept out of the darkness, ever closer to Victor as he struggled in pain. There were no grenades attached to these extra traps, so all we could do was watch and see what would happen. As the pack came ever closer, what must have been the alpha of the pack, stepped out in front of his legion and towered over Victor. This creature was something else. Honestly, my jaw fell to the floor as he emerged from the great darkness. He had to have stood over terrifying 11 feet with a massive barrel chest and a tapered waist. His arms much longer than I stood tall. I could see his hot breath seemingly steaming out of his open maw as it whipped around in the breeze. 
the Alpha leaned down closer to Victor and smelled deeply with a chest rumbling growl. Victor, to his opportunity, grabbed and tried to swipe or bite the Alpha's face or throat, as it was a huge mistake as he reacted with a mighty howl up into the night sky. In his large hand, he now stood, holding Victor down by his head. The Alpha stopped howling and picked Victor up into the air before thrusting his razor-sharp claws and hand deep into Victor's ribcage, yanking and pulling out the werewolf's bloodied organs. The pack howled in unison and scared the living daylights out of all of us. And then he threw the near lifeless body of Victor, the original werewolf, into the waiting bay and pack in the field. The sounds that followed are too graphic to write here, but let's just say it took a long time for him to die as they hungrily ate at his body and organs. We slowly backed away back to the trucks, or some chose to return to their dirt bikes. As I turned the ignition and my headlights lit the field ahead, the scene was shocking. What I thought was maybe 70 dogmen at most, it was actually more like around 150. Can we just get the hell out of here, please? screamed Jerry, knocking me from my gaze. As we turned the truck around, the monstrous Alpha turned to face us. Go! Go, go, go! Again, Jerry shouted in panic. I am, I am. God, Jerry. You know what? Sometimes you can be a real bitch. The Alpha never leaving his gaze on us as we hauled us out of there and back for the final return to Taylor. Wow. Wow. Hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did writing it. Thank you all so, so much for your wonderful, wonderful positive feedback. Um, absolutely humbled and touched, really am. And it just spurs me on to write more and more. Um, as ever, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. And don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. And remember, if you're ever driving down old Taylor Road with the long grass and cornfields either side of you, the sun dipping in the horizon, make sure you keep your eyes on the road and not at any distractions. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>